tonight on CBC Vancouver News. It really starts and is being driven with rapid increase in those who are most connected in our communities. A pandemic of the unvaccinated, why you shouldn't expect case numbers to drop anytime soon. Also, it's communities that have never had to contend with this issue before. How BC's deadly drug toxicity crisis is affecting the South Asian community. And why people taking photos of coyotes is in part to blame for recent attacks in Stanley Park. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening and thanks for joining us. So, well, it's the pandemic of the unvaccinated. That's what BC's top doctor is calling the COVID-19 crisis in our province right now. She also says it's unlikely we'll see cases drop anytime soon, despite the latest restrictions. Isabel Regan is here live with us. Isabel, I guess my first question is why aren't things expected to change? Well, it's because the Delta variant is just so infectious that even with higher vaccination numbers, the most we are expected to see is to level off by the end of the month. Here is a projected scenario for the next four weeks if transmission rates get a little higher than what they are now. The purple line is showing us the number of people BC projects will be vaccinated, but we still see hospitalizations and uh, increasing and new case counts surpassing 1,000 a day. And this is all by the end of September. The green line is if we see higher vaccinations than projected. But let's take a look at a better scenario if things stay the way they are right now. Where they are is lower transmission, and that means we'd see more of a plateauing or leveling off, but still no big drop in cases. So who is driving this wave? Dr. Bonnie Henry says this is a pandemic of the unvaccinated, and this is very clearly what she means. Look at the difference here in cases among unvaccinated versus vaccinated. This is the rate of cases in green and hospitalizations in blue from July 1st to August 20th. While both of those lines spike in early August, there's only a slight increase in those fully vaccinated. Now, when it comes to who is dying, people who are not vaccinated represent about 52%. The people who have had one dose or both who are dying are for the most part over the age of 80. So young people between the ages of 19 and 39 are driving uh, the rise and increase in cases. And we know in that age group that they were the last of our age groups to be able to uh, access immunization. And we know that they're very highly connected in that age group. We're also seeing the increase as we did in previous waves uh, with the 40 to 59 year old age group. And in this age group, the risk of being hospitalized has gone up. So, Isabel, this is all based on the modeling presented today, and these projections are before school has even started. So what is Dr. Henry saying about back to school? Well, it's all a lot of information to take in, but Dr. Bonnie Henry says she's optimistic and hopeful a vaccine will be approved in the fall for kids 6 to 11 years old, and that cases among young children in the province have only risen slightly, and very few children have been hospitalized. And while she's recommending all staff and students 12 and older get vaccinated, she says there are currently no plans for mandatory vaccines in school settings. Isabel Regan reporting live for us tonight. Thanks, Isabel. The number of new COVID-19 cases in BC is still high as the province records 655 new cases today. Sadly, two more people have died of the virus. Another number rising, hospitalizations. Those are up to 187 with 103 people in intensive care. But on a more positive note, 85% of all eligible adults in BC have received at least one dose of the vaccine. And a dangerous trend growing south of the border is also taking off in B.C. Humans taking deworming medicine made for animals. People are believing a false claim that the drug can treat COVID-19. Taking ivermectin is a threat not only to people who are ingesting it, but also the animals who need it. Staff at this supply store on Vancouver Island watched the number of customers asking for the product grow from a few to so many it left shelves empty. Now they're asking buyers why they need it and refusing to sell to anyone using it on themselves. Well, that medicine isn't available for those animals because people are taking it without any basis for doing so whatsoever, responding to fake news and phony information. So it's the animals that are suffering. 
The B.C. CDC says nine cases have been reported in B.C. in the last six months of people who took ivermectin and became sick afterward. On to the province's other health crisis now stunning numbers. We now know drug toxicity is the leading cause of death for people between 19 and 39 years of age. And it's clear B.C.'s crisis is heading for its worst year. More than 1,000 people died of an illicit drug overdose between January and June of this year. This is the highest rate ever recorded in the first six months of a calendar year. 71% of those who died were aged between 30 and 59. 80 percent were male. Fentanyl was involved in 85 percent of the deaths. The BC Coroner Service says none of these deaths include prescribed safe supply. Now, John Hernandez is looking at advocates saying the need for a safe supply of drugs is urgent as deaths continue to reach record highs. She just was a fun kid. This is probably how Deb I Bailey has spent nearly six years trying to heal. In 2015, she spent Christmas Eve in a Vancouver morgue where she identified the body of her 21-year-old daughter, Ola. And I remember thinking, it's, oh, it's like a TV show, you know, where you open the door and it's not my kid. You know, but it was my kid. And there she was laying there in the clothes she had left in, looking like she was sleeping. And you're just, you're shattered, really. She was 20, 19 or 20, right there. Her daughter overdosed on fentanyl, so now Bailey spends her days advocating so the same tragedy won't happen to other families. She's among those rallying on International Overdose Awareness Day. Today, crowds marched through Vancouver's downtown east side, calling for improved access to safer drugs as the number of overdose deaths swells. Toxic drugs continue to flood the streets. Like, there's no more heroin anymore. Heroin's like a thing of the past. It's all fentanyl. Trey Helton manages this supervised injection site. He says everything tested here is contaminated. Some users are even fooled into consuming other hazardous chemicals. Sometimes people will bunk people on the street. They'll sell like drywall dust or cement dust as, as, a, as fentanyl. And uh, people will unknowingly inject that or smoke that. While the downtown east side is the most visible example of the toxic drug crisis, overdoses and deaths are spread across the province in all communities. There has been as many as 15,000 emergency calls since January. That's on pace for an annual record. Total deaths are also on track to surpass last year's all-time high. We know what would stop the deaths. It's not residential treatment beds. That will come, but right now we have a toxic drug supply out there and we need to look at all the avenues we can find to keep people alive. And that would include providing people with a safe supply of drugs that are not going to kill them. The province is slowly rolling out a safer supply program, but people here say it needs to happen now. That's why they're handing out lab tested drugs themselves and sending the message that these lives can't wait. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. And coming up, we'll speak with Upkar Tatle. He does outreach work in the South Asian community. He tells us why the crisis remains unspoken about in that community, who is dying, and why the situation has been made much worse by the pandemic. Okay, if you were thinking to visit Stanley Park before the end of summer, well, you're running out of time. The park will be closing at 7 p.m. each night from now on as it tries to clamp down on coyote attacks. The latest happened yesterday morning, and there's suspicion people may be feeding the animals. Dan Burt is live tonight at Stanley Park. Dan, first off, what can people expect come 7 o'clock? At that time, they can expect to see more barricades blocking the main entrances and the trails to Stanley Park, the thousand acre wood in the middle of this city, and they can expect more park rangers. Now, the park has already been closed from 10 p.m. to 7, 6 a.m. each night. That was for fire hazard, but conservation officers have warned people to stay out of the park because of the dozens of attacks by coyotes on people since the early part of this year. Now, the latest attacks, as you mentioned, come after from Friday morning to Monday morning, all at dusk or dawn. Conservation officers have already asked people to stay out of the park. The board says it's had heard stories of people coming here with raw chicken, bird seed, cat food, heaving it into the woods and trying to lure the animals out for photos. 
It's working with the province, conservation officers, and the Ecology Society. Take a listen. We removed five coyotes from the park. We thought that would do it. We changed out garbage cans happening right now, putting in wildlife-proof garbage cans to, uh, to make sure that food isn't uh, um, readily available. So we're doing everything we can. Again, the board admits it's a tough park to close completely. Some people in the park we spoke to today are surprised by the early closure. Have a listen. It's a not really that big a park. I'm kind of surprised that they weren't able to uh, figure out the coyote situation before they have to shut it down. These people are jogging on the seawall at like 5.30 a.m. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's bizarre what people are just not, you know, responding to the what the parks board is saying it's very difficult to enforce this with the parks as big as stanley park uh people walk on the seawall looking at the you know watching the sunset people are removing the barricades oh, yeah, yeah, so they're yeah. still going in there they're taking down the yeah. tape and everything but it's going to be very difficult to enforce Researchers have also suggested after putting cameras in the parks that it could be late night visitors and people leaving garbage here that are enticing these animals to come here. Again, it's still not exactly clear why this massive uptick, but again, at least 40 attacks on people by coyotes since the first in the first nine months of this year. Anita. Scary stuff, Dan. OK, thank you. People living in the Okanagan woke up to a rare sight this morning. Steady rain falling and puddles on the road. But relief for wildfire and drought relief may be short-lived. BC Wildfire is welcoming the opportunity. The weather is giving crews to fight back the flames. But the rain is far from the moisture needed to douse out-of-control wildfires. There are 226 active fires in BC right now. 16 are large or threatening enough to be considered fires of note. More dry, above-seasonal temperatures are expected through September. Meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff joins us now with the forecast. And Joe, talk about that weather change in the Okanagan. Uh, Silver Star Resort in Vernon getting a bit of the white stuff today. It's true. We said it. And I, I like that they managed to slide it in before the end of August. Not totally uh, out of the norm to see a light dusting on the interior uh, ski resorts, but it is the first of the season, and we even saw a few flakes fly at the top of the Coquihalla. Let me show you, though, a different kind of uh, severe weather we saw across parts of Metro Vancouver today. You're looking at that heavy downpour for the Tri-Cities. If you got caught in it, you know. If you didn't, well, it was a lovely day. We really just had pockets of convective cells leading to uh, pooling on the road, some localized flooding, the Mary Hill bypass, uh, seeing some good flooding, really just lasting for a few hours this afternoon. But that is thanks to the same system that brought the cooler weather and showers and snow to the interior as well. Uh, let me take you to the radar where you can see, first of all, the cell uh, earlier this afternoon and those lightning strikes between Coquitlam and Pitt Meadows uh, passing off for now. Again, that's all thanks to the same rotating low that continues to bring showers tonight to the interior. And that northerly flow is what brought down those cooler temperatures as well. But uh, as Anita mentioned, really dropping the fire danger rating for much of the province. First time we've seen uh, this much blue, the very low in the forecast map. I've got uh, showers departing for tomorrow and a return to summer for a couple of days. Uh, no 30 degree temperatures, but Anita, hopefully nobody put away their entire summer wardrobe yet because we do have some summer heat ahead. I was close, I was very close. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. The trial over the workplace death of a construction worker crushed by a falling boulder has been called off just a week before it was set to begin. The prosecution entering a stay of proceedings. Sam Fitzpatrick was killed in 2009 while working on a hydroelectric project north of Powell River. After a long investigation and delays in the legal proceedings, the employer, Peter Kewitt, Sons, and two former managers were set to face charges of criminal negligence causing death starting Tuesday. Prosecutors announced today after a review of the evidence they feel convictions would be unlikely. And after more than a decade of questions and controversy surrounding the privatization of Vancouver's Little Mountain lands near Queen Elizabeth Park, we now know the details of the sale. The CBC's Jeremy Allingham has obtained a contract through a Freedom of Information request. 
The contract shows that the B.C. Liberal government of the day gave Holborn Properties a $211 million loan interest-free for a term of 18 years. An additional $88 million was loaned to Holborn for the construction of non-market housing at a low interest rate. That loan is repayable by 2050. The contract is also devoid of much in the way of timelines or deadlines for the completion of social housing units. The site used to be home to 224 such homes, but around 700 people were evicted after the sale of the land in 2008. They were promised they could return, but only 53 units were ever built. Ingrid Steenhusen is one of the few original Little Mountain residents still living at the site. So many families have waited for so long that the majority of them most likely may not qualify to be able to return. David Chudnovsky is a former NDP MLA who's been active on the Little Mountain issue from the start. No wonder Holborn fought so hard to prevent it from being made public. And no wonder they've been sitting on the land doing almost no building for all these years while the value of the land goes up and up and up. How could this tragedy have happened? We need answers and we need them now. We need a public inquiry. The price tag on the sale was $334 million, but BC's Office of the Attorney General confirms that only $89 million has been paid by Holborn so far. The initial value of the land at time of sale was a reported $77 million. That value stands today at more than $316 million. The CBC requested interviews with Holborn Properties, the BC Liberal Party, BC Housing, and former Housing Minister Rich Coleman. None was available for comment. Jeremy Allingham, CBC News, Vancouver. It was the closest race in the country the last election, and Port Moody Coquitlam has the potential to be that way again. The potential is making it a popular stop for some of the party leaders this campaign. As Susanna DeSilva reports, it isn't just the leaders who know how much of a difference each vote could make. There are almost as many signs on this road as there were votes that separated first and second place in the last election here. It came down to a difference of 153. I mean, I'm even talking my own household saying we have to like uh, get together and really like all vote the same. So we're not canceling out our votes. Last election, Michael Turner's household of four, including his wife and two adult children, each voted differently. But in another potentially tight three-way race, not this time. We've actually all laid a brochure out on the counter, tape it there. We've all sort of been like, putting notes down why that candidate's the better person for the job. So, so you're all trying to sell each other on... Absolutely. ...interest, <laughs> and that's not something you've ever... Never, to... never. I want to say a huge thank you to Benita Zarillo. Those potentially winnable voters has had some of the leaders out in force. The NDP's Jagmeet Singh made his second visit today. Justin Trudeau visited on the second day of the campaign. The presence of the leader can help perhaps uh, uh, bring some attention to, to that party, but I think it also provides a useful backdrop for a number of different issues, given that it is the kind of riding that is facing challenges that we see across the province and across the country. So whether they were talking about uh, child care for young families, whether we're talking about housing concerns. Messages the candidates are talking about. More and more families are having to move farther and farther away from our community to make ends meet. We have a fast growing uh, demographic. So the key issues are affordability, affordable housing. The Conservative incumbent Nellie Shin's campaign said she was unavailable today with other campaign events. And voters here say they have lots on their mind, including that their vote could really make a difference. It makes me think that it's really important that everybody kind of does their part and votes. Because it could have gone a very different way then. We know that housing is very expensive here and around Vancouver. Um, that's something that I've been thinking about. Um, Health care, it's a huge issue. Uh, the long care homes is something that we needed to address. With many here saying they are still undecided. Susanna De Silva, CBC News, Port Moody. Thanks for being with us tonight on CBC Vancouver News at 6. I'm your host, Anita Bath. And if you're not already doing it, you can always watch our program live on our free app, CBC Gem. You can also catch us on Facebook, YouTube and Instagram. After 20 years, the United States has withdrawn from Afghanistan and just minutes later, 
a Taliban celebrating a big win. We take you to the region next. Thanks for staying with us during our commercial free live stream. Well, travel restrictions have led to some creative alternatives for people looking to share special moments during the pandemic. And for a bride in Toronto, it was her best friend on the other side of the Atlantic showing up at her wedding as a hologram. Talia Ritchie has more on how it happened. I'd like to introduce you to one of Britney's bridesmaids from London, Sarah Redden. Ring, ring. London calling. This Toronto bride had a feeling there was a surprise in store on her wedding day. But a hologram appearance from her best friend was certainly not what she expected. Did you really feel like when that was happening that you were living in the future? Yes. Well, my aunts actually said that they felt that they were on Star Trek. Thank you, Jeff. Husband of the year. Art Media is the company behind the technology. We capture people in one part of the world and we beam them anywhere else in the world where they have two-way interaction in real time with very little latency. So this is how the hologram is captured. You can see there's a green screen behind me. And then this is what an audience could potentially see. Me on stage anywhere in the world. Clients come to us for a number of reasons. One is obviously trying to get people to meetings they can't get to otherwise, but a growing number of people are coming because they're looking to reduce their carbon footprint. I don't think it's something you're going to be using to visit grandma anytime soon. This tech expert says while holograms may not be accessible to everyone yet due to cost, he believes the demand for different ways to connect will rise, especially during and after the pandemic. We've been living online for a year and a half at this point. And we're looking for a different sort of connection to one another. So this technology is speaking to that. In what ways do you think this technology still needs to grow? Well, I mean, it'd be great if I were seeing you as a hologram as well. But, uh, you know, we're probably the smallest scale hologram company out there in terms of the footprint we actually need to pull this off. And so, you know, the smaller and smaller we can make that, the more accessible it is to everyone in the world. Let's do a little COVID bump out here. And we'll beam him out. Coming to you from the future, Tally Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. The Taliban is celebrating the final retreat of the U.S. military and having all of Afghanistan under its control. But soon its focus will have to shift to governing a country in deep economic crisis. As Susan Ormiston shows us, the Afghan people are anxiously eyeing an uncertain future. Extraordinary images on the Kabul airstrip this morning as Taliban leaders strode confidently onto that airstrip, flanked by Taliban fighters wearing mostly U.S. supplied military uniforms and wielding their assault rifles. The Taliban leaders congratulating their fighters for defeating a great power. The U.S. aggression was a reckless act from the beginning, says Taliban spokesperson, and their defeat should be a message for all invaders. The airport is now under full Taliban control, but it's not operational yet to commercial air traffic. The Taliban said it may call on the Turks and Qataris to help get that airport up and running, a critical link for those who still want to get out of the country. 
needing to flee and also for humanitarian aid coming in. A humanitarian crisis may be brewing as people are out of cash, civil servants haven't been paid in months and food prices are rising. So real concerns there. One Kabul resident said, we don't want a foreign power in our country anymore, but what we need is bread and water. So a real focus on their economic concerns. Here in Pakistan, the foreign minister says he expects a new Taliban government to be announced within days. And at the market here, we spoke to several shopkeepers who support a change of regime to the Taliban, saying they look forward to the borders being more open and it's good good for business. But back in Kabul, many people very wary, very worried and anxious about what the new government will bring, especially since many hardline leaders have emerged from hiding and are expected to take key roles in that new government. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Islamabad. U.S. President Joe Biden is pushing back against criticism about the frantic U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. He says there was no way to better plan given how fast the Taliban took control and highlighted the more than 120,000 Afghan Americans, Afghans, Americans and other allies that the U.S. extracted from the country. He says he takes full responsibility for the decision to end America's longest war. I'm the fourth president who has faced the issue of whether and when to end this war. When I was running for president, I made a commitment to the American people that I would end this war. And today, I've honored that commitment. It was time to be honest with the American people again. We no longer had a clear purpose in an open-ended mission in Afghanistan. After 20 years of war in Afghanistan, I refused to send another generation of America's sons and daughters to fight a war that should have ended long ago. It's day 17 of the federal election campaign, and the Assembly of First Nations has released its top five priorities for whichever party wins. As David Thurton reports, all the politicking is happening while the country continues to come to terms with the discovery of unmarked graves at residential schools. With memorials like this one in so many Indigenous communities, Ed Bitterno's wonders why Indigenous issues in this election aren't front and centre. It does surprise me with what happened with the, uh, with the Kamloops discovery and with the other discoveries across uh, Canada. We had a ceremony... To in the third week of the campaign, the Assembly of First Nations released its priorities. The issues that First Nations face are ongoing. They are... Um, there's a legacy of underfunding and neglect by successive governments uh, since the beginning of Canada. The AFN is calling on the next government to create a national healing organization, prioritize business and job creation, and cut carbon emissions 60% below 2010 levels, all the while addressing systemic issues on reserve. Children in our communities are living in, in overcrowded houses, 10 to 20 people per house. Children in our community are attending schools that are, are not to the same standard and not funded to the same amount as the rest of Canada. But despite the challenges that lie ahead, the AFN sees promise in the party platforms. I've read certainly about uh, the five pages that exist in the Conservative document. And to me, certainly that uh, indicates progress because we know that First Nations have had a difficult relationship with uh, previous Conservative governments some progress, but not enough for bitterness. Well, in a sense, I've decided who I'm not voting for. He's still undecided. David Thurton, CBC News, Ottawa. BC students head back to school next week with the COVID-19 fourth wave in full swing. While we know transmission within schools was previously low, we want to talk about how the emergence of the Delta variant could change that. So joining me now is pediatric infectious disease physician, Dr. Laura Sauvey. Thanks for talking with us today. Good afternoon. Thanks very much for having me. Dr. Sauvey, we're seeing more and more hospitalizations of kids with COVID in the U.S. now. 
frightening for sure for some parents here ready to send their kids back to school next week. What are we seeing in BC right now in our hospitals and, and in the community? Yeah, so that's a good question because I think we all have been seeing what's uh, happening in the United States. Here in BC, we've had the Delta uh, variant make up most of our cases of COVID since um, about mid-July. Um, and we've had a stable proportion of, of kids who are getting COVID compared to adults. But importantly, the number of hospitalizations are stable. So it continues to be about 2% of, of pediatric cases. So why is that? Why are we not seeing it as bad as the Americans? That's a good question. I think it's there's probably lots of reasons, uh, and I think a lot of it has to do with sort of the, the the layers of protection that we have. So we're really lucky in BC that we have much higher rates of immunization than many parts of the United States, um, and that's one of the biggest factors that helps protect us. But also, we continue to have uh, many of our layers of protection in place. So while Many people use masks less over the summer. We continue to have a fair amount of mask usage through the summer, and, and we're going to have mandatory mask use in schools into the fall. Um, we're also, we also continue to have some of the other public health um, restrictions, like less really big events. And uh, we're continuing to have a uh, to, to continue with the message that we should all stay at home if we're sick and not uh, go to school and not go to work with when we're sick. And I think all of those things combined, plus the fact that we have um, uh, t testing and treatment more easily available for people um, compared to in the United States, I think also makes a difference. Dr. Laura Save, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks very much. Alberta is also aiming for a more normal return to school. Thousands of students are headed back to the class starting tomorrow. And as Erin Collins shows us, precautions vary widely among location. An annual tradition with a pandemic twist. This year's school supplies complete with COVID protection. Okay, here's your hat. Always. And your mask. Still in the midst of a fourth wave, this school year comes with risks. It's Jax that I worry about because he's he's a, he's 11 and he he's a small for his age and he has a heart condition. Just like last year, masks are mandatory at public schools in Calgary and Edmonton. Cohorts and social distancing are back too. With a thousand new cases of COVID every day, you know this is the prudent, cautious measure. But protocols to keep kids safe at school aren't universal across Alberta, the province leaving it up to individual school boards to decide what to do. Masks aren't mandatory everywhere here at Weber Academy, but they have beefed up their COVID surveillance, including this high-tech temperature reader that sets off an alarm anytime anyone with a fever walks by. Kids returned to class at this Calgary private school last week. It's up to them if they want to wear a mask. No distancing or cohorts either. The focus here, getting back to normal. We very much agree you have to start living with this because it may not go away in our lifetimes. And so it's, it's time to really um, adjust. Well, how long this new normal can last depends very much on the virus. And some worry that as Alberta's schools reopen the fourth wave, could pick up steam. The worst possible situation for spread is an indoor space where there is a large number of people for a long period of time. And that pretty much summarizes what schools are. A return to class more risky for young kids unable to be vaccinated. The province gambling that its youngest residents won't get too sick at school. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. More on kids' mental health now in the pandemic. More than one year of lockdown measures and a lack of regular social interaction can have a profound effect on children. As Vicadopia reports, recent studies show many Canadian kids reporting symptoms of depression during the pandemic. There's little doubt children have paid a heavy price during the pandemic when it comes to their mental health. This is supported by various studies throughout the country. The latest comes from Ontario and Sick Kids Hospital, where researchers tracked 2,700 children throughout the province during the pandemic. What they found was an alarming rate of what they classify as clinical depression. For children under 12, it was reported to be approximately 50%. For those 12 to 18, 70%. 
What they also found was that kids from lower income families, the problem was especially acute, and that online socializing didn't necessarily improve symptoms, and neither did loosening public health restrictions. In other words, when they reached that level of depression, the symptoms pretty much stayed there throughout. And that's why researchers are still unclear what will happen if those symptoms will alleviate once children return to school. We really don't know. This is uncharted territory for us. Um, I think that for some kids getting back into those social interactions, so not just school, but being able to have those positive interactions with kids, albeit done safely, but interacting with other parents, other kids, being involved with their activities is going to be really important and will hopefully get them back on track. Um, I, I will anticipate, as do others who work clinically, it's not going to be that simple for everyone. The National Crisis Line Kids Help Phone has also seen an increase in young people contacting them over the past year with feelings of anxiety, stress and depression. And that's been particularly acute in the last few weeks. So at least one of the senior directors there doesn't expect the situation to alleviate in the coming weeks as children return to school. As we enter the fourth wave, there's still so much uncertainty ahead. Vicadopia, CBC News, Toronto. Staggering numbers about the toxic drug crisis in BC, but coming up after the break, we speak with an advocate in the South Asian community. He tells us who is dying and why the pandemic has made it so much worse. Homeowners have frayed nerves too, trying to keep up their mortgage payments, especially homeowners in Vancouver. Houses there cost more than in any other city in North America. Because of that, mortgages are among the highest too, and nowhere else in Canada are so many people so desperate to sell their property. Russ Patrick has a story. Karen and Bill Hardy have been trying to sell their suburban home for four months. They reduced the asking price twice to $239,000. They've been having open houses seven days a week. Last month, a man from Calgary made a $100,000 down payment on the house, but he couldn't get a mortgage for the rest. I don't think the price is the problem. I think it's the high interest rates. People just can't qualify for mortgages. I don't think it's the price at all. So many houses are now for sale in Vancouver that it takes nine volumes to list them all. And the listings just keep adding up. Last August, 2,000 homes sold in Vancouver. So far this August, only 300 have sold. Every day, hundreds of people are slashing their asking price thousands of dollars. Who are the people who are most getting hurt in this crunch? It's the average middle-income person, the, the, the basis of what Canada is. Uh, the people who bought in the suburbs of our major cities, and here in Vancouver especially, with the highest house prices on the continent, a $100,000 mortgage at 22% is a lot of money. The Wall Street Journal referred yesterday to the collapse of housing prices in Vancouver. People in the yeah, business like acknowledge that. things are bad, but say they're not that bad. A, a virtual collapse, uh, we're, we're getting almost back to wartime terminology, no, nothing like that. Uta Peerless has been trying to sell her home for six months. She's brought down the price from 179 to 139,000. That's considered cheap in Vancouver, but there have been no offers. She and her husband are in a real financial bind. Expecting to sell their old home, they bought a new one How in much March. How costing you uh, and your husband now to keep this house and, and the new one you've bought? $4,500 a month which is fairly steep, <laughs> needless to say. And you're, you're paying $4,500 a month in payments on the two houses. Right, of which $3,000 is just going to interest. No one in the real estate business in Vancouver expects interest rates to go down very much, if at all, over the next six months. That means buyers will remain scarce, in spite of the fact home prices will continue to drop from the astronomical highs of 1980. Russ Patrick, CBC News, Vancouver.
Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Modeling shows BC's COVID numbers will continue rising and may simply plateau. And that's to bring the numbers down. More people need to be vaccinated. The province also revealing data that says the pandemic is now largely affecting the unvaccinated and that those who've not had the jab are 17 times more likely to end up in hospital. Stanley Park will now be closed every day at 7 p.m. after a recent spike in coyote attacks. The city's park board is blaming, at least in part, people feeding the animals raw chicken and cat food. They're trying to draw the animals out to get photos for Instagram. Now the main entrances to the park will be barricaded. Stunning numbers to tell you about on Opioid Awareness Day. More than 1,000 people died of an illicit drug overdose between January and June of this year in B.C. This is the highest rate ever recorded in the first six months of a calendar year here. Most people are dying in the Fraser Health region and Vancouver Coastal Health. What today's numbers leave out is how the drug toxicity crisis affects marginalized and ethnic communities. I'm joined now by Upkar Tatley, Executive Director of Engaged Communities Canada. He also does outreach and research on how the crisis is affecting South Asian communities specifically. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, the data we're getting from the province is not typically broken down by communities, but your research shows South Asian males represent a significant number of overdose deaths in the Fraser Health region. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, the research that was conducted was is now quite dated. In fact, we do need to update that, but it did demonstrate that over a three-year period, approximately 2015 up to 2018, there's a significant increase that represented around 255% increase in the South Asian community, of which 97% were men. And why is this crisis hitting the South Asian community and these men so hard? What are the factors here? Yeah, I mean, like I mentioned, there, there, there is an overall increase that we saw across the region, across the province, in fact, across North America during that same time. However, it was focused heavily on racialized communities, and there's numerous factors that do contribute to that. Uh, th this is where the pandemics really played a big role. So when, when the pandemic came in, our borders got slammed shut. So any of the drugs we had in in-house, let's say, they stayed here and there was no refreshment or resupply coming from overseas. And so what people turn to, especially when it comes to fentanyl, which is ultimately what was uh, killing a lot of people, these opioids, um, they were able to cook it up in their kitchen sinks, lit quite literally. You can find the recipes online, unfortunately. Maybe I shouldn't share that, but that's the sad fact. And so, you know, you had up, upwards of 14 and 14 plus analogs, synthetic analogs of fentanyl on the street. And it was very, it was highly toxic. And, and there are significant barriers that exist for racialized communities to obtain the resources to offset the dangers of overdose. So you put this all together and what you have is, is a horrible elixir that ultimately equates to the ever increasing number of deaths we see from the toxic drug supply. I'm from the community and I feel as though it's really not talked about a lot, um, you know, and it almost needs to be talked about a lot more. And that's where that stigma comes in. Um, how do we address that? How do we get people to talk about it more? You're absolutely correct. It, it's one of the, you know, we, we, in, in our work, that's one of the biggest things we have to contend with. Really what it is, is it's communities that have never had to contend with this issue before in the way it is now. The toxic drug, drug supply is just so proliferating. It's proliferating everywhere. And it runs the gamut of everything from shame to uh, there's the old uh, model minority myth that they're trying to uphold. A lot of people are new to the country. And so they do feel a sense of obligation to not talk about challenges that they're facing. Um, and so, so it's, it's just, it's a horrible set of factors that are contributing to people just upholding these stigmas and, and refusing to have these conversations. And you talk there about um, people new to the country, the new immigrant community. Do we know who is actually dying um, within the community? I know you said it's males, but are these new immigrants? Are they people who have been here for a long time? Yeah, unfortunately, it is a mixture of people. Uh, there are new immigrants, but at the same time, it's often people like myself who were born and raised in Canada or those who have been here for numerous years, up to about 15 years. And, uh, people who are, and in fact, are, that's what the research showed, is that these are people who had jobs. They were in the construction trades, either uh, driving truck or they were working construction as well. 
and uh, they had families. Many were fathers. In fact, 85% of the people in the, in the research were fathers. Uh, they, they came from households. Um, so it, it really does change who the, the narrative around this, and in fact, who is dying. So it, what it shows is that we can no longer discriminate between populations. It, in fact, the toxic drug supply does not discriminate. So we, in turn, have to make sure that when we do deploy resources and solutions, it's inclusive and meant for everybody across Canada. Apkar Tantley, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. The remnants of a much reduced Hurricane Ida are heading to Canada, but in the southern U.S., the storm is still leaving an impact. Why some may be without power for weeks next. And at 644, you are looking at a live shot at the Whistler Golf Club. Is summer set to make a triumphant return? Well, Johanna has the answer next. He was a doting, loving, caring, ordinary father. 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 He was their father. I'm auditioning for the role of Billy. I'm here for the role of Billy. Auditioning for Billy. This is Billy. How would I summarize the story of Billy Tipton? He was a transmasculine jazz musician. When I encountered Billy Tipton, that was the first time I encountered transmasculinity. Those of us in this generation, we are in a much different place than Billy Tipton. We are public in a way that so many trans people before us haven't been able to be. Trans people's survival through history was based on invisibility. It's scary when centuries of your survival have been based on not being seen. And you have no models, you have no history. It's like you never existed, but you know you must have. And then you see Billy Tipton and you think, People like me existed and they did things. They were jazz musicians, maybe one of the greatest jazz musicians ever. So that you're looking for someone who exists like you so you're not alone. I'm Billy Tipton. My band is here for the... Sorry, I, I wasn't expecting you to be here. Well, uh... same to you, buddy. There's a whole history of media where you see people and you don't realize that they're trans and then something gives it away. And more often than not, it's the voice. My voice still squeaks. It keeps dropping, so I can't get used to it. I'm still trying to make my voice sound deeper all the time. <laughs> it's such a volatile and complicated thing to imagine that we know what people's gender is from looking at them. It's not a question about passing. It's a transition story about somebody who's unhappy about something in their life, and they figure out the way to make themselves happy. Billy Tipton was so ahead of his years to be brave enough to hide in plain sight. He feels like he's the only person in the world who's like him. I've had that moment. So much of my not being seen as a small person has led me to this role of somebody who desperately wants to be seen. Lots of people in my community look to your dad as a kind of hero. It kind of blows me away that, you know, after all these years, anybody even remembers him. I thought I was like totally alone in this. Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox.
September is Literacy Month. Have fun and support the cause by joining CBC Vancouver's Dan Burrett at the Virtual Team Trivia Challenge. Register and learn more at dakota.ca. And join CBC Vancouver's Angela Sterrett at the Ravens Feast Gala and Art Auction, a virtual art and culture experience in support of the Bill Reed Gallery. Get tickets and learn more at billreadgallery.ca. The remnants of Hurricane Ida have now moved north, but for millions in the southern United States, the devastation is just beginning. Ida's path of destruction has forced many from their homes, and as Chris Rees shows us, there's no word yet on when they may return. Flooded streets, people rescued by boats, more than a million in Louisiana and Mississippi now without power and water. It was bad. It was the worst thing ever. It was the worst thing ever. I got my baby out, though. I wasn't going to stop until I get my baby out. We saw that tree swaying back and forth, and then about five minutes later, the whole thing just snapped and fell over there on the house. After Hurricane Ida slammed the state on Sunday, emergency officials are now concerned about the dangerous conditions for recovery efforts. Louisiana's governor sending a clear message, don't come home. The schools are not open, the businesses are not open, the hospitals are slammed. There's not water in your home and there's not going to be electricity. At least four deaths have been linked to Hurricane Ida. Half of those in Louisiana, but the governor predicts there will be more. I expect that number's going to rise. But historically, we know that most people are injured and killed because of the response, not the storm itself. In Lafayette, Louisiana, rescue crews are getting some reprieve after a full day of helping people out of their homes. Most of the houses had up to a foot of water inside of the homes. Corporal Brandon Fontenot and the Louisiana Wildlife and Fisheries crews performed more than 200 rescues in Laplace and Lafitte, including helping this woman out as her house was filling up with water. They made the 911 call. They decided, you know, they they, they didn't feel safe there anymore. They, they were afraid of not being able to get access. So the water you're looking at is actually the roadway. So, and you can also see on the house the water mark so where those bricks are a different color, that's actually how high the water got. A very long recovery effort ahead there for sure. That's the CBC's Chris Rees reporting. Okay, meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff joins us now with the forecast. And Joe, I know tomorrow is a pretty big day for you. It's true, Anita. Tomorrow is the official start to meteorological autumn. <laughs> I don't know who's going to be celebrating with me, but uh, yes, <laughs> climate speaking, we actually count the fall season uh, to add up our numbers a little easier. It kind of lines up with what we see September, October, November. So I'm gearing up. Don't know about uh, all of you, but we will still see some summer days ahead, as I mentioned. And as we've been saying throughout the show, uh, a lot of our climate models do indicate a warmer than normal September for the province. Let me take, take you to the temperatures across the country. We've got a nice little uh, cooler pocket across BC right now. Seeing some cooler temperatures across the Great Lakes. Very warm temperatures, though, and through central uh, Canada. We're not seeing it right now. Regina, 13. But tomorrow, temperatures will be uh, well up into the high 20s. And Atlantic Canada, speaking of Ida, getting some very heavy rain over the next couple of days, uh, thanks to the remnants of Ida. Just wanted to show you the afternoon highs we hit today. Just 19 at YVR, 16 Pitt Meadows, and over towards the island, uh, 16 for Van uh, Victoria Harbour, I should say. So uh, cooler than seasonal by a good 4 to 5 degrees. And across the interior, that's the kind of uh, weather we needed to lower the fire danger. 16 and through Kelowna was the high today. That's all thanks to that swirling low that is continuing to track east. High pressure will be the province's story for Wednesday and Thursday. Almost everyone getting sunshine, rebounding close to seasonal. Uh, before another system rolls in. That one will bring rain Thursday night to northern BC, tracking down to the south coast for the weekend and bringing some more showers to the interior for the weekend. But a couple of summer-like days before them. 20 and through Kelowna, still not quite at the seasonal mark, but lots of sunshine. 20 for Victoria as well. Seeing sunshine all the way up through central and northern coastal sections. A rare day that almost all of BC, a few exceptions uh, in through uh, the Peace region, we've got some morning showers, but all of, almost all of BC sharing in the same weather system for tomorrow and Thursday. We'll watch for those increasing clouds on Friday, temperatures dropping down with that next system that will move down our uh, north coast. And then at this point, I know it's the last unofficial weekend of summer for many, 
for a return to school. But Anita, uh, I'd start to uh, get the indoor plans ready. At least one of the two days looks like a washout. Well, I will do that as I celebrate meteorological fall with you, Yes, Joe thank you. I'll get the hot chocolate ready. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. It's not the stowaway you're hoping to discover. What happened when a polar bear came on board a ship in Greenland? That's next. The tiny community of Point is made up of cornfields and covered bridges, railroads, and little rivers. For the few hundred residents who live here, the center of town is the ball field. Well, it's been my life. This is my home away from home. Sometimes they said it was my first home. This is the field that George built. He played his first game of softball near here in the 1940s. In the 50s, he worked to clear the land where this field was built. In 1959, this was all alders when we started to clear it and belonged to Bayard Hoyt, and he come down with a bulldozer and helped us. And back in 66, that's where our first, we won our first maritime championship, intermediate D. We played 16 games, 18 games, won 16 to win the championship. And then it was just getting better. In the 80s, it was the good teams. We won 47 provincials, 15 Eastern Canadians or Maritimes, and three midget nationals. That's for my coaching. In the early 80s, he worked to install the first set of lights to illuminate a ball field in New Brunswick. In 87, George doesn't play as much anymore, but he does throw out the opening pitches at tournaments on the field that now bears his name. And he's pretty proud of his latest addition to the field, a men's latrine, where nobody has to miss a second of the game. And he hasn't missed much ball here, judging by the stacks and stacks and stacks of records and statistics from nearly every game to take place on this field. I've got all the batting averages from 1959 to 2005. All of the scorebooks from this at the same time. And all kinds of pictures of all the different teams. When you first started playing here, yeah. there was one team. The Hoyt Jets, yeah. yeah. And how many teams are there now on this field you helped build? Now there's under 16, under 14, under 12, under 10, and four little teams. Learn to play programs. And for that dedication to the game and the community, George Gillett will be inducted into Softball Canada's Hall of Fame. Not that he considers himself a big deal. What happened, George? I don't know. <laughs> what happened? Come on. Yes, <laughs> come on. Oh, just another Hall of Fame. George is just inducted to the Softball Canada Hall of Fame. <laughs> I didn't really need, need another one. I have you know, one to three now. Support New Brunswick, Southall New Brunswick, arm up to an area. Five of my teams has been on, has been in the hall too. But I have to do what I'm told, I guess. I'm all. What? We call George the Godfather of softball, and and you know he's the one that started it. He created it. You know he he's created the branches off the tree of all the volunteers and organizers that have come behind him that give back to the community and you know softball probably wouldn't even be going if it wasn't for George still being involved in the game and the contribution he's made to people's lives and, and teaching them how to give back to the communities. Well, it's like something out of a movie. Crew members on a ship in Greenland were shocked to find out they weren't alone. A polar bear was on deck with them, and that polar bear had been following the ship for days before getting on board. The CBC's Teresa Hayatsuk tells us the story. Niels P. Christensen is a crew member on the Sunnaktit vessel. The vessel had been sailing around northeast Greenland when a bear got on board. Christensen says the bear was following them for days. The chef on board was cooking in the kitchen when he suddenly spotted the bear. It moved slowly in the direction of the smell from the stove. Christensen closed the door on the vessel and fired a warning shot to scare the bear. The bear showed no fear and because they couldn't kill it, 
helicopter was needed to chase it down from the ship. Although bear sightings in East Greenland has become more common, they cannot kill any bears in defense. Teresa Khayachuk, CBC News, Ikhaloui. And they might not be polar bears, but a wealthy Argentinian neighborhood is facing a big rodent problem. And these aren't just rats or mice. They are the largest rodent in the world. People who live in the community on the outskirts of Buenos Aires say there has been an invasion of capybara animals, which are about twice the size of beavers. The upscale development was first built about 20 years ago on wetland, that is capybara's natural habitat. And now that the last section of the wetland is being developed, more and more animals are showing up. While many are complaining that capybaras are destroying their lawns, the animals are also attracting people who want what else? Selfies with the rodents. Polar bears may be cuter, although the capybara is pretty cute, but not sure I would take either of them. Thank you so much for watching our show tonight. That is it. You can always find us on demand at cbc.ca slash bc. And Dan Bird is here tonight at 11 o'clock after the National. Good night.